All right, so good morning, everybody. My name is Sabera, and I'm organizing a workshop called Taming Complexity, Discovering Interpretable Latent Spaces. But I'm giving a talk called The Case for Uninterpretable <laughs> Latent Spaces. And so the reason I'm doing this is because I feel like as a community, I just really want to understand what we mean by interpretable and what we mean by a latent space. And as Eric already alluded to, my talk is going to depart a little bit from what we chatted about this morning. Uh, the reasons being I'm going to posit a framework for what we as a community consider to be an interpretable latent space. And secondly, I'm going to kick off the computational side of the day. And so instead of trying to understand how the brain is encoding, like all the things we experience from memory to speech to motor that have been talked about, I'm going to be talking about how we can take that data, put it into computational models, and understand their latent spaces. So if you were here this morning, it's going to be different than what you experienced this morning. All right, with that, let's get going. So this is just an outline for what I'm going to chat about. It is a lot that I'm trying to pack in, so I might have to skip through some things a little quickly. But since it's recording recorded, you'll have some of my slides. So the first is we're going to go through a framework for neuroscience latent space modeling, at least the one I use. The next is a data problem. The next is interpretable, an interpretable latent space definition. Then I want to talk about data and models. And the last is probing the latent space, decoding, distance, and lower dimensionality. All right, so with that, we're going to start off with a framework for neuroscience latent space modeling. And the reason I say that is because there's a lot of us in this community that care about how the brain works. And then there's a lot of us in this community that care about how the brain works, but are going to focus more on behavior. And so I just kind of want to lay out how different people think about it. This is definitely not comprehensive, but it's just how I think about it and may help you put in context a lot of the talks you're going to get later in the day into this framework if you like. All right, so to start off, we have neural data. We all look at neural data. We all want to interpret neural data in some way. And you can do this by trying to go from neural data to what the brain is doing. So I'm going to call that brain's latent. You can also take it to behavior and try to understand, OK, how is what my neural data is doing linked to behavior? And so when we're looking at this, there are a few ways to break it down. The way I'm going to think about it is observed and unobserved. And so when it comes to brain's latent, that is a not observed property. We don't know the optimal algorithms that we're using to do a compression of you know, memory or speech or motor that was talked about earlier. And that's why those talks are trying to understand how we do that. Of course, neural data, you're getting your calcium imaging, you're getting your spikes, you're getting whatever. It's observed. You have that. Behavior, you can also have observed. You might have video, et cetera. But you'll see later that might not always be the case. And so when I think about generating latent spaces, you can generate in both directions, because we want to go from neural data to brain's latent, neural data to behavior, or other topics that might come up. These are just two big ones that I feel like are studied a lot. I mentioned before that when it comes to observable behavior, a lot of people do modeling with observed. A lot of people also withhold that data. So they might record it, but they don't actually want to use it because they're going to use their behavior labels to verify, does the latent space that I generate do a good job at separating out, let's say, a mouse running or walking or sniffing or whatnot? All right. So this is, by and large, a framework that I like to think about let's say, generating latent spaces. And I think it's helpful just to think about your definition of latent spaces and how it falls into this framework, if at all. All right, so now we're going to move on to a problem with data. And so it's a really important component of create, creating these behavioral latents. And to do this, I'm actually going to borrow another domain. So I'll, I'll take questions at the end, actually. Um, so I'm going to borrow from another domain, which is vision. All right, so in deep learning, you can think about ground truth in several ways. And a really popular one is label-based, meaning that somebody has gone through their data set, they have annotated it. And once you've annotated your data, you can like use those labels. And as many of you in this room know, annotating a data set is not an easy task. It takes a lot of time, and it's very painstaking. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about vision and annotation right now. So in this first image, or this first set of images, I want somebody to tell me what these pictures are of. And it's not a tricky question. So someone just like shout out, what are these pictures? Cows. cows, perfect. OK. So we know these are cows. And what I want to do is I want to see what does a recognition algorithm tell you are the top five labels for these images. And what a recognition algorithm is, is you can just think of it as like a classifier, except instead of classifying one thing, it's going to give me like a set of the top five, top 10, whatever. 
All right, so we're going to start off with the first one just so you can see the output of this recognition algorithm and you can understand what we're, what we're looking at. So on, this, on the far left picture, it is a cow. You get 99% certainty that's a cow. You get pasture, grass, there's no person, and mammal. So I think this pretty much makes sense. And honestly, this is pretty consistent. I think you guys all know what's going on. So let's just zoom through the others, and it should be pretty obvious. There are cows. All right. Does somebody want to tell me what they're seeing? No cows. No cows. All right. Does anyone know why? Context. Okay, I don't know who said that, but what do you mean by context? Uh, the surrounding uh, information that is about the cow. Absolutely. So I don't know if everybody understood that. Um, I will rephrase it also because I have the mic. It's about context. And what you have to understand is that cows are very associated with like the pasture that they are in. Cows are on grass, you see a sky, whatever. You're not used to seeing cows frolicking around in the sea or sitting next to you know, a boat on the beach lounging around. Because it's something that is very often in images with cows, what these models are picking up on is the fact that I always see a cow with this pasture, so I'm gonna link these two together. The background plus the thing that I'm actually trying to decode. And so, what we're seeing is that these recognition algorithms are not doing a good job generalizing to these new environments, meaning that the cow is an uncommon in the context of a beach. And for me, this is motivational in a few ways. The first one, it demonstrates that in this very simple context, the label that is associated with cow, or what I'm gonna call our ground truth for this example, is more closely tied to the surrounding of the environment rather than the cow itself. Secondly, and I hope you can all appreciate this, if this is happening in images, can you imagine what is happening in the brain? Like images, we know what a pixel is, we have some understanding, the pixels are linked together, we don't really know what's going on in the brain, definitely not as much as we understand what's happening in these visual systems. And so I think that this motivates why it's so important to use many notions of ground truth when building out a model that creates latent spaces as well as, as well as downstream metrics that verify that these latent spaces are actually giving us the information that we think they are. Okay. So we're gonna keep going on this data problem. And so I mentioned in the last slide that it's really important to use many notions of ground truth. But how are we supposed to do that if, let's say, in the behaviors of mice running in cages or whatnot, we only have one behavioral variable that we're measuring or we're marking? And so this is an answer to that question that satisfies many deep learning researchers. And it's a very active area of research. And I'm sure a lot of you have heard of it. Eva's going to talk about it later. Isong's going to talk about it later. And the answer is self-supervised learning. And so I'm not going to get into it because they're going to give you a lot more context. But just all you need to know is that it's how do you learn from yourself? How do I, the data, get to learn from me? And I'll give you an example. You guys probably know MNIST as a data set. And so MNIST is an image data set. They had many handwritten, handwritten images. So you see a two on the far left, and that's the original input. I'm going to talk a little bit about what an encoder decoder is. But again, Esong and Eva are going to get into it more. So if you have questions, wait for them. You can pass in this original image into an encoder, you'll get a compressed representation. Then from that compressed representation, which in deep learning is oftentimes low dimensional, lower dimensional, you'll pass it through your decoder and then you get some reconstructed output. And what you want to see is whether or not that reconstruction matches your original. And so that's just the notion of self-supervised learning. How do I have an original? I make something that I think, I compare them to each other, and then that's, that's what I'm gonna use to learn. All right, so it, moving off of this example, I want to talk about some self-supervised learning principles and goals just to give more context. So one of the things we would like to do is learn intrinsic characteristics of the data. The second thing we would like to do is if we have those essential characteristics, we can view self-supervised learning as a form of compression. Next, if an encoder-decoder network, which you might also have heard of as an autoencoder, those are the same thing, so don't be daunted by it, represent the essential characteristics of data as an embedding, we can use these embeddings for downstream tasks. And the goal is the embedding that we create really encapsulates our data. Like, I want it to encapsulate the cow. I don't want it to encapsulate the pasture. All right, so hopefully that was good enough. If it wasn't, wait for Esong and Eva. They will do a great job. And 
We're going to move on to interpretable latent space definition. And I understand that a lot of you have different definitions of interpretable latent spaces. And I just want, I don't want to say that mine is right. I'm sure that yours are also right. And we're going to have this be a little bit collaborative. And there's a panel at the end of the day that I hope you bring your definition to. So I do not think that I'm saying this is the right definition. That is it. All right, so we have a framework for X that we've decided. We have an understanding of the data problem, and we're ready to jump to this definition. So I want you guys to pause for 15 seconds. You can, we can close your eyes, you can keep an open, whatever. I want you to think about what is your definition of an interpretable latent space. All right. Now I'm hoping that I can get some volunteers to tell me what their definition of an interpretable latent space is. A smaller space that encapsulates all the important complexity in the larger space. Okay, so say it one more time, an, a lower dimensional space. That captures all the important um, information in the larger space. Okay, that captures all the important information in the larger space. Great, sure. One that you can verbally describe to someone else. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Do we have another? Sure. Uh, the axis of greatest variations should reflect some physical variables. So the axis of greatest variations, variations should encapsulate uh, some physical quantities. Some physical quantities. Okay. All right. We're going to do two more. Sure. Okay, so say one more. An embedding that encapsulates the true generative model or process of the original data. Okay, wonderful. Okay, I'll do you. Yes. Um, I should be able to draw, confidently draw scientific conclusions from my embedding space. All right, I should be able to scientifically draw conclusions from my embedding space. And just so you know, the reason I'm repeating it is because I've got the mic and we want people to hear. Okay, we'll do, we'll do one more. Okay, repeat it one more time, but go chunk by chunk so I can repeat it for, for everyone. So, so I think it's important to have the variables in the latent space that can be either mappable to the physical variables that we can measure. Okay, so pause. Uh, interpretable space means that we can map the things from the latents to the physical variables that generated them. And or that you can map them to uh, uh, some like, variable in a series. Okay, and or we can map them to a variable in a series. All right, so I don't know how many people I asked. I think it was seven or eight. And I think we kind of got seven or eight definitions, but there are, let's say, core components that you guys are all sharing, but we're not maybe using them in the same framework. So I'm not saying that my framework is right, and I hope that you ask these questions to our panelists tonight, and maybe we can make some progress in defining what is an interpretable latent space. And let's say you don't have a definition of interpretable latent space. What I would like you to do is, of the seven or eight answers that we've heard, take your favorite one and borrow it from that person. And think of that as my definition for what I'm going to show you through the next few slides. All right, so just five seconds. That was the one I like the best. That's maybe think about why you like that one the best, and that's your latent space. All right, wonderful. So I'm excited to see how your guys' def definitions mapped onto my best effort to generate a definition. And if you didn't have one, just borrow one. OK, so interpretable latent space definition. The whole purpose of this workshop, which I don't think I'm going to answer in the way you guys want me to, but hopefully you don't throw stones or something. All right, at the main meeting, Sheena Jocelyn gave this like really nice encapsulation of um, Richard's original definition of engram and ecfury. And she said something along the lines of, I really like Richard's definitions because they sort of say nothing, but they give you a sense of what we're talking about. But others really have a problem with them. And she later, it's, yeah, so some of you laughed. And the reason is because, like, it's true. Like, we saw his definition, and I'll put it up on the slide, and it felt good, but it didn't mean anything. And so, in a similar vein, I'm going to look at the title of this workshop. Taming Complexity, Discovering Interpretable Latent Spaces in Human Brains and Behaviors. To me, this feels really good. I like this. It sounds awesome. 
But I really like our workshop title because it sort of says nothing, but it gives you a sense of what we're talking about. But at the same time, as like an engineer, I really have a problem with it. Because as I will tell you, I have had multiple of our wonderful speakers telling me and emailing us and being like, Severo, what do you mean by latent space? And literally last night, there were a few of us that met up and we had a chat about like, what are we even saying? Like, what is a latent space? And so I'm gonna hope that we work through it. And if you're not happy with it, that's great. Tell me why and let's make it better. Okay, so going back to Sheena, it's kind of hard to read. I'm not gonna read it. It doesn't make so much difference. She put up Richard's version and then she gave her own. In a similar vein, I would like to embody what I consider one of the best stylistic talks of this conference. I would like to take our workshop title, Taming Complexity, Discovering Interpretable Latent Spaces in Human Brains and Behaviors, and I wanna do something with that. I wanna make it more like something I can bite into. All right, so in order to do this, I wanna start with latent spaces. Like what is a latent space? And as my advisor was very, 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 let's say forceful with, in a sweet way, in a sweet way, he said a latent space is a space that is not observed, that is it. There's nothing else that a latent space is, period. <clears throat> However, for neuroscience, I think you guys want more. Like that is true, but that doesn't help us that much. So I'm gonna add some things and I'm gonna put caveats on these things because it is not like an encompassing definition. The first one is be lower dimensional. And this was something that a lot of you guys said in this room. In Uli's talk this morning, he created a latent space that I would argue is very useful. It was not lower dimensional. It didn't change the dimensionality, but it changed how we think about the representation. In addition, when you think about it in deep learning, so that's not neuroscience, fair, but when you think about it in deep learning, a lot of times you move your latency to a higher dimension because it becomes more actionable. And I'm gonna come back to this word of actionable, but you shouldn't necessarily think that lower dimensional means better. So it's a debatable point, but for now I'm just gonna acknowledge that it's not perfect and I'm gonna go with it should be lower dimensional. The next thing is that it needs to remove redundancy. And redundancy is another one of those words that sounds really pretty, but I don't actually know what it means. And I'm not gonna do the work of defining this for you. Esong is gonna do the work of defining this for you. So if you have a question like, Sabera, what do you mean by redundancy? You want this to be like, you know, something I can bite into? I agree, you can pass it on to Esong. He's gonna tell you about this thing called parsimony. Wonderful. Moving on to the last thing, and this might be a controversial one, but I really do believe in it. I want it to encapsulate multiple tasks. A lot of the neuroscientists, they'll study, let's say, a behavior. I'm gonna work, work on neuro to behavioral data. And they'll say like, okay, I want my latent space to separate out whether or not, and this is a real example that we used in our Chen data science bootcamp. I want it to separate out the fact that if I have a mouse in a cage and I put a female mouse in, I can tell whether or not I put a female mouse in or I put a male mouse in. And I want it to separate out the sex of these mice, the visiting mice. Okay, so I can do that. But can I do anything else with that latent space? Not really. So like, wh why is that a valuable latent space? Should it just be something that encapsulates one task that this animal does? And I see Chathan being very confused and I'm gonna come back to this and hopefully I satisfy you. All right. So next thing what we're gonna do is we're gonna move on to interpretable. And for me, latent interp interpretability is when one can assign semantic meaning purely by examining and embedding. And this was another thing that some of you guys mentioned in your own definitions of latent spaces. And so here, semantic meaning, also one of those words that feels really nice, doesn't mean anything. And so what I'm gonna take to be semantic meaning is actionable. And that's gonna come from like more of a decoding framework and I recognize that and there are pitfalls to that, but for now that's what we're gonna go with. Okay, so now what do I mean if we take what we talked about with latent space and we take what we talked about with interpretable, what is an interpretable latent space? And so an interpretable latent space is a lower dimensional, which is not perfect, non-redundant, Isang will get into it, general purpose representation of your data that is actionable. I'm gonna say it one more time. A lower dimensional, non-redundant, general purpose representation of your data that is actionable. This is not perfect, I understand that it's not, and I hope you'll work with me to make it better. Okay, so I'm very happy that we could fill this out, and hopefully, you know, it's not perfect, but hopefully it's better than what we started with, and I would argue that it doesn't sound as nice, but it gives me a little bit more. I can do more with this. Okay, so now what we're gonna move on to is, and actually let me check on the time. Seven minutes. Seven minutes, okay, we're gonna go very fast. 
Okay, I'm gonna talk about data and models. And so earlier this morning, uh, Bing gave a wonderful talk on her data and what her lab does. And she discussed her data set Agile 12. And if you don't know about it, I recommend that when we post these recordings, you go back and watch her talk. You can also check out the paper, just Agile 12. So I'm not gonna go into it other than to tell you that it's ECOG data, ECOG meaning electrocorticography, and we have 12 patients. I'm only gonna show you the results for three. Okay. so. We studied this in a context, and the paper is down here if you want to check out the archive preprint. We studied this in a context of reconstruction of data. So what you read in the paper is not going to talk about the latent space stuff that I'm talking to you about today. That is new. However, the framework of the data, as well as the models that we use, come from this paper. So if you have questions, check out the paper. Okay, so I mentioned ECOG data. If we look at the top piece of this neural imputation problem, with ECOG, you've got patients that have electrodes in very different locations on the brain and different numbers. And I don't get to control where I put them because they're very clinically derived. Essentially, you can have missing data because you know an electrode dies, it breaks, hardware fails, software, you know, there's noise, all of these things. And what we would like to do is we have these incomplete tensors of you know, electrodes that are gone because they've broken or noise or whatnot, and we have present electrodes, and we would like to reconstruct that, that tensor the tensor of electrodes by days by time series instances, we want to make it full. Because human data, very difficult, I don't want to throw it away. And I'm not going to get into it, but if you're curious on like how the time series actually falls into an instance, we can get into it later. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to look at a convolutional neural network autoencoder. And so I'm not going to get into how we train it, but we use a self-supervised loss and a self-supervised paradigm. And what we do is we take in this data, we pass it through and we tell the model, I just want you to reconstruct my data. I'm not gonna give you a label, just reconstruct it. Okay, this is great and this does it in a single patient context. And we can get into why. Um, it's because patients have different numbers of electrodes that I cannot right now, and Ava will actually probably talk about a way you can get around this, but I cannot right now handle that. So in addition to a single patient model, what I can do is I can develop this multi-patient model, which basically takes, let's say I have a patient that has 100 electrodes or 90 or 30, and put them into like the same dimension and then pass the middle through a shared network. And that allows us to put it into a similar latent space. All right, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna go, I'm running out of time, we're gonna go very quickly through probing this latent space, and this is all new work, it's not published. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at it in three different types of, let's say, actionabilities. One is decoding, the next is distance, and the last is lower dimensionality. Okay, so I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna put up the single model and the multi-patient model, and then I'm just gonna have like a tree that tells you what I'm doing with it. It's gonna be a lot, and we're gonna have to go fast, but if you have questions, you can come up, chat with me after. Okay, so the, what I'm gonna do is I've trained this network, and it creates these latent Zs. I'm then, I'm only looking at three patients, not all 12. I'm gonna take the latents from patient two, five, and nine. I'm gonna pass them into a feed-forward neural network, and then I'm gonna explore the three dimensions I discussed. PCA on the outputs, distance, and decoding. All right, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna actually talk about decoding until the end after I've shown you all four, four iterations of this model. In the next slide, I'm just gonna show you distance and PCA on outputs, and I'm gonna have to go very fast, so I apologize. But I just want you to get a sense of like different ways that we can measure this latent space and how we can see if it's actionable or not. All right, the far left, what I'm doing here is I'm taking all the different um, time series that comes from patients and so you can kind of see that there's this like blue box. There's one in the top, and there's a big one or big, bigger one in the middle, and then there's one in the bottom that's very small. And that's because the test data that I have from the patients, I do not have the same number, I have very different numbers. And so what I do is I take, I take the output from that feedforward ne neural network, which is about 6,000 dimensions, and I'm comparing it in terms of distance to, and I have two minutes. Okay, I'm comparing, okay, I'll get into it later. What you can see is that there are three squares that appear. The reason that there are three squares are because there are three patients. The other thing that I'm doing is I'm just taking this, these latents, I'll go back a slide. I'm taking this lat latents from the feed forward, that I've passed to the feed forward neural network, passed it through PCA, and then done it to three dimensions, and I'm showing them with different behavior labels. So in the top, I'm showing rest or move, like the humans are literally resting or moving, and you can see that with this rest remove, they're really intertwined. I get red and purple in all clusters. In the bottom, I get really good separability, and that's because there are three different patients, and they separate like really cleanly into this. 
Okay, we're gonna have to go very quickly. The next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually separate those latents, separate them, do PCA, PCA on them first, and then span out into PCA on outputs, distance, and then decoding. The reason I do this is because perhaps the model is learning like these really specific notions of a patient in this feed neural network. I just wanna do PCA to almost regularize and take away any like patient specificities that are coming out of the fact that they have different electrodes, et cetera, just to show you kind of a different view of the data. What this looks like is this. And so you see that triangle thing that I was describing, it goes away. And when you look at what happens in the latent space at the bottom, which is patients and super separable of four, it goes away and it's better. However, there's this big X in the middle of my distance and it comes back in this plot here. So there are things that we're removing, these squares are gone, but you still get something that's not super, it's not super separated. All right, the next thing that I'm gonna do, and I apologize for going so quickly, I'm gonna do the same thing, the exact same procedure with my multi-patient model, where the difference is I've trained it with all three patients end to end. So there's a non-linearity that has learned how every patient is like related to each other in its latents. Its latents meaning the, the multi-headed CNN autoencoder. Okay, zooming through, you get this. It is much more similar. And even when you look at the latent spaces, you can see that patients are more entwined, both in terms of move rest, which is like an action, as well as their identity. And just a reminder, in all these models, I did not give uh, like move rest as a label to the data, and I also did not give um, patient identity. Uh, we then do the same thing with PCA on this multi-patient, and I get something similar. So I'm not gonna go into decoding, which is another way that you can measure this because I literally do not have time. This is the move rest accuracy for the multi-headed CNN, the individual CNNs, and then the PCA kind of divisions of joint and individual. And you can see what chances. I did the same thing with decoding the patient's identity. Um, I'm not gonna go into it, we can chat after. And this is what they look like together. I'm sorry that I'm not giving you any conclusions. And when you put everything together and you see what, what pops out, if we have the multi-headed CNN, the individual CNNs that we concatenate, and then the ones that we do PCA, the striking thing that you should see is that we have this, div, like, this interpretability, this super nice interpretability in the plot where it's the individual one. And for a neuroscientist that would be like, oh my God, yes, like I get to see my patients, they separate, that's awesome, they're different. But what I would like to tell you about this is that multi-patient modeling gives more uninterpretable latent spaces, but is an interesting scientific problem worth pursuing because it shows you that patients are sharing more than they differ. And the uninterpretability shouldn't deter us from working on these problems. And that is why my talk is called the case of uninterpretable, I guess, latent spaces. And so I know I have like not a lot of time left, but I hope I've convinced you that multi-patient modeling and uninterpretable latent spaces drives interesting scientific problems. And in the spirit of cosine, I want to leave you with a few questions that I ask myself about these topics. And if you ask these of our panelists, I know that we're gonna have a fantastic discussion. The first being, does our human desire to visualize latents in 3D or at most 4D, which is 3D plus time, handicap how we're even conceiving of these problems? The next question I would like to ask is assume you have neural data and multiple labels attached to it. As a community, do we believe that a latent space that classifies one label well, but not the other, a good latent space? And if so, why? The last thing I would like to ask is what should we as a community want and expect from our latent spaces versus what do we as a community that want and expect from our latent spaces? So this is a question of what do we want versus what are we doing right now? All right, I'm definitely over time. So I just wanna say thank you. Um, these are where I got my funding from and where I sit. And so I hope you enjoyed the talk and I will take as many questions as I can.